How many of you have seen uh, that movie, uh, uh, Finding Nemo? Yeah. And there's a new one coming out, Finding Dory is coming out. That's kind of exciting. And uh, I love it when uh, they're going through and there's all those beautiful corals and the little urchins and the little sea The little things that go like this, those are really nice. Well, it turns out that uh, those are beautiful, but they're also a little bit in danger. The good news is we have someone who has a very cool job to help and preserve those. So please welcome marine biologist Mar Hart. Everyone, how's everyone this afternoon? Good. Well, I'm super excited to be here, and for the next 10 to 15 minutes, we are going to immerse you in the world of what it's like to be a marine biologist. But I warn you, my journey through the oceans has not been totally conventional, so we're not going to stay underwater the entire time, but we will start there. So I can't tell you when I first fell in love with the ocean. I have just always wanted to be on, in, or under the sea since I was a little kid. That's me playing in the water. I grew up just up the coast in Connecticut, and that's actually in Long Island Sound, just a couple of years ago. <laughs> During middle school, I went to camp and spent my summers down in the Florida Keys where I learned to scuba dive and to snorkel, and where I first fell in love with sharks. In fact, I fell in love with sharks so much that I actually decided to graduate high school early and go spend the second half of my senior year studying them down in the Bahamas, which for any of you who remember your second half of senior year in high school, I was pretty nerdy, but it was, for me, the better choice. Down there, I also learned a lot about coral reefs, which became my true passion. This is what I studied when I went to college and then on to graduate school. And to study coral reefs, we get to wear funky outfits like this, mask, fins, big tank on your back so you can breathe underwater, called scuba diving. Anybody here do scuba diving? Excellent. Well, since we can't actually teleport ourselves down to a tropical reef in the Caribbean at this moment, we are going to have to use our imaginations and a little bit of sound to set the scene so that we can go dive on our coral reef today. And I'm gonna need your help. So who's ready to help recreate a coral reef? Okay, all right. So we're gonna go section by section of the audience and I'm going to assign you a different sound that is going to paint the soundscape of a coral reef because coral reefs are actually really noisy places. The first sound that we hear when we get on our boat to go out to a coral reef is the lovely lapping of the waves. So this part of the ocean, you're going to be my surf sound. Can you all make a shh, 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 shh. Excellent, okay, hold that sound, hold that sound. The next sound, so we're gonna quiet the surf and we're gonna go underwater. You hear that crackling, crunching? It's the parrotfish. These guys have big beaks that they use to scrape seaweed and keep the coral reef clean. So this part, all the way to the back, you guys can be my parrotfish, so. Excellent, good parrotfish. All right, save that sound. Move to the next section. Other fish on the reef. Can you guess what these guys might be called? Grunts, because they grunt. So, right down here in the middle, let's hear your best grunt. Excellent, good, good. Okay, and now, one of my favorite fish on the reef. These are the Goliath groupers. They're one of the biggest reef fish in the world, over 800 pounds. And they make a deep, booming bass, like a doo, doo, doo. So, right down here, you guys can be my Goliath groupers. Let's hear your biggest booming bass sound. Do, do. Excellent, good. And then last but not least, some of the smallest animals make the biggest sounds. These are the snapping shrimp. And they make this crackling, popping sound. And if you can't snap, you can use your mouth. Little clicks. Excellent, very good. Okay, so let's practice this again. Over here, let me hear the surf. Excellent, and parrotfish chomping. Grunts, give me some grunts. Big booming bass of the Goliath grouper. Okay, okay, and the snapping shrimp. Okay, we're gonna put this all together now to make our reef, okay? So keep snapping, let's get some surf. Parrotfish, grunts, grouper. Close your eyes. There we go, we're on a reef. Let's make it loud. Ah, good. All right, and now 
Wow, let's bring it down. Quieter, 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 quieter. All right. Many of the reefs that I dove on were beautiful, loud places. Some of them were quiet. And a quiet reef is a sign of a sick reef. Some of the reefs I dove on looked more like this. There are lots of problems facing our ocean today. And part of my job as a marine scientist is to study not only what goes right to make a reef healthy, but also what's going wrong so that we can try to fix it. So I spent a lot of my time diving on corals. We lay down long transect tapes. We swim along them. We count the corals. We count the fish. We count the sea urchins. We count the sea algae. And we try to see and look for patterns in what makes a reef healthy and what makes them sick. And this was all fantastic. I got to spend a lot of time out in the water. I got to see a lot of really cool animals. But I also realized that not a lot of people knew what the problems were, right? Because we, when we look at the ocean, it looks the same. We can't see underwater. So I decided that I needed to start not only studying the reefs, but also talking about what was going wrong. I wanted to be the Lorax for the seas, since the seas have no voice of their own. So I started writing stories about what was going wrong, and then I teamed up with an organization that I work for now called Future of Fish. And we are a bunch of scientists and journalists, people who are experts in business and strategy, and we work together to help innovators and entrepreneurs who are trying, entrepreneurs are people who run businesses, who are trying to make solutions that help us work with the oceans in a healthier and more sustainable way. And there's lots of different ways we do this, but one of the main things that we focus on is overfishing. So has anybody heard of the term overfishing? Yeah, OK, good, right? So that's when we take out too many of the ocean's life and they can't replenish quick enough. So this has happened in our own backyard right here in New York. Did you guys know that there used to be huge oyster reefs in New York Harbor? Who here knew that? Awesome, awesome. So oysters are awesome animals, right? Somebody tell me something cool that an oyster can do. You can eat it, yeah? Yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely cool. What else? They can make pearls, that's right. The ones right here off of New York, unfortunately, don't make pearls, but most, most do, yeah? They clean the water, that's right. Thank you very much. So, here we have two tanks. This is ocean water from right off, right off the coast here. This was collected yesterday. Oysters were put in, and in one day, this is how well they can clean the water. Yeah, right? One oyster can filter 50 gallons of water a day. So oyster reefs are really, really cool. They're natural water filtration plants. But because they taste so good, over the last 150, 200 years, we've taken most of them out. So this has led to all sorts of problems, and we're trying to fix those problems by now starting to put oysters back in. And some of the groups that I've been working with lately, the Hudson River Foundation, New York, New Jersey Baykeepers, there's all these different organizations out there that are finding new ways to build oyster reefs and put them back into the environment. This brings housing and habitat for fish and crabs and shrimp, cleans the water. So another thing that healthy oyster reefs can do, you guys know what that is? They form underwater walls that act like barriers that can help control storm impacts. You know how bad Hurricane Sandy, they're not gonna stop flooding from a big storm like that, but they're definitely going to dampen and lessen it. So getting our oyster reefs back out into the waters is really important for helping to stabilize and secure our coastlines. So oysters are really, really cool. There's also another way that we can get oysters back in the water that we've been working on. That's with a guy who lives up the coast in Connecticut. His name is Bren Smith, and he used to be a uh, commercial fisherman, and he's now turned into an oyster farmer. And he does a new kind of farming called 3D ocean farming, where he hangs ropes down from this array that floats on the surface, and he grows oysters and scallops and clams and seaweeds. And by growing all these things in this new way, he's creating new habitat for fish, he's cleaning the water, and he's producing local food. So in my organization at Future of Fish, I work with my colleagues to try to help folks like Brand, help folks like Baykeeper, to figure out how can we get these ideas to spread? How can we get these innovations to be picked up in more places around the world so that we can start restoring the habitats of the ocean? And the thing that gets me really excited is that the oceans respond very quickly. Oceans are, we call this being very resilient ecosystems. So even though they're facing a lot of threats, 
when we start to change things, they start to bounce back very, very quickly. One of the things that I get most excited about is how quickly baby fish can come into the oceans and replenish an environment. So, unlike mammals, fish can make lots and lots of babies, as can corals. The abundance is beyond what you could believe. In fact, it's something that's motivated me to write a book that I'm working on now, which is all about where baby fish come from and how much more baby fish we can make in the ocean if we start managing it right. Now, it's hard for me to show you all about baby fish, but baby corals is something that we can go take a look at back out on our reef. So, just to show you how much potential and how much abundance is still out there that we can be fighting for, let's put our masks back on, put on our fins, and we're gonna now go dive back onto the coral reef but we're gonna do it at night. And we're gonna pretend that it's the third day after the full moon of August, okay? So about two months from now, we're gonna go into the future. And going down right after sunset, we're gonna take our flashlights and peer underwater, and at first, what you're going to see are some bumpy, rocky-looking things. These are the corals. And if you peer really closely at a coral at night on a reef, you'll start to see little animals the size of your thumb, and they hold these tiny little pink spheres. Looks like little tiny balls of candy. You can see them here. These little balls of candy sit in the mouths of the coral all across the reef, and then at exactly 90 minutes after sunset, miles upon miles of reef, something amazing happens. All at once, all at the same time, the reef goes pop. And every single coral releases its bundle, creating this snowstorm. These bundles hold the sperm and eggs for the next generation of corals. This is where the baby corals come from. And it pours forth like a blizzard underwater. Except instead of snowflakes, they rise up and they're bright pink. It's a pretty spectacular event and it happens every year, nighttime on the reefs. And it's gonna happen this year again. It'll happen the year after that. Because despite all of the challenges and all of the threats that are facing the oceans these days, the corals are soldiering on. All of that potential is still there. So we just need to get out there and study it and figure out how we can make more and more coral reefs, how we can make more and more baby fish. And that is what I do now, taking my science and combining it with other folks and their skill sets to come up with new solutions to help us create a future that is full of fish. Thank you.